welcome back to this four part series where we are building a dApp from start to finish. This is part three where we will be hooking up the front end. So if you want to follow along, please watch part two before this one because it will set you up and you'll know what we'll be busy with today. Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Daniel aka Hashlips and before we start off, let's just make sure that we still have our node instance running. This is where we left off the last time, so just make sure you followed the previous tutorials. This is still running and it's looking good. Next, we need to, like I said before, compile with hardhat to make sure our contract is fine. We're going to run our test and then we're going to deploy the contract. Now that we have this deployed, we will have the contract address and this will come in handy just now. So just keep this in the terminal, copy and paste it, save it somewhere. We're going to incorporate it in our front end in just a second. The next thing that we have to double check is that on our MetaMask extension that we are indeed on the local host network. So make sure that you have that set up as well as a private key imported like we did in the previous tutorial. Now we have everything running and ready to begin. So the first stage is to go to the source directory, to the app.js file. Let's go ahead and clear out the return statement. We're also going to clear out everything here in the app component. We want to start off very, very clean so that you know exactly what's happening and how to hook up the front end. Okay, so at the top we have our React imports, which we'll need. We have ethers.js, uh, and then we have this greeter from the old code. Basically, this is pointing to our artifacts over here, and inside of the contract manager.sol, we get our manager.json. So we need to change greeter to manager over there, as well as here. This is because we need this to point to this JSON file, which contains the new ABI of our contract. Next, what we'll need is a few state variables. So we will need a name and this we're going to assign a set name to so we can set it. It will make use of the use state hook. And for now, we're just going to set it to an empty string. I've explained before how the use state hook works. You have a variable and if we call this setting this variable it would re-render the page and that's why it's important to have a few key state uh, variables that we can manage for our front end app we are going to make use of these variables throughout our app and i'll explain as we go along but for now also uh, let's also make an account variable and we need the set account as well and this is going to be equal to a string. The account variable is actually where we will save the user's address, the ETH address. Next, we're also going to need a contract. So I'm going to make a contract variable up here and also have the set contract. And then this, instead of being an empty string, we're just going to make it null for now. Once we've instantiated a new contract, this is where we will save it so that we can interact with that particular instance throughout the interface. And then lastly, because our whole app consists out of tickets, tasks, whatever you want to call them, we need some kind of way to say these are our tickets and also set our tickets. These are so that we can represent the tickets in the front end DAP and work with them with state, update them, manipulate them and so forth. This will be initialized to an array. And these are all the state variables that we will really need. So the next thing that we'll need is some kind of initialization function. This is going to be our function. We're going to call it init connection. And this should only happen once, once the application loads up. And we should be able to call this again when we want to connect our wallet. This function will take care of instantiating a new contract as well as making sure we get the account. But first we need to check if the user uh, or the browser actually facilitates and has MetaMask. So we're going to say, well, 
if the type of window.ethereum is not equal to undefined, it means that there is an instance there and we can make use of it, most probably MetaMask, and else we need to tell uh, the person to install MetaMask if we can't find it. For now, we're just going to console.log this out, saying that please install MetaMask and that we can handle on a later stage. The next thing we need to do is call this function and uh, we're gonna make use of the use effect, which we can use like this. We need to pass it in an anonymous function as well as an array of dependencies, which we'll leave empty for now. And then we're simply just going to call the initialization function. But now we need to expand this and actually bring up the pop-up of MetaMask to help us connect the person to our DAP. So the code that we'll need to do that are these three lines. Basically the first one we are assigning to an accounts variable and it does the ETH request accounts uh, method calling it and then MetaMask will pop up. It will give us back the accounts. We also then set the provider to the window.ethereum instance aka the MetaMask provider and we also have a signer. This is important so that we can perform um, request you know on our contract once we have instantiated it now that we have the variables we can actually update our state the first state is we're going to set the account to the accounts here that we have we're going to set it to the first account at index zero next we're going to set the contract as well with this piece of code over here so we're setting the contract over here and um, what we are basically passing into it is an instance of a contract and this is created by ethers.js and uh, what it needs is the contract um, basically the address the abi which is our manager abi and then the signer but this is an old address so we need to copy the address from our terminal this one over here and replace it and there we go. Now we should have a connection and an instance of our contract. To test some of it out, what we can do is actually add the account over here in the div. And we will be able to see the user's account on our page. And then also, maybe we can just leave a console.log here. And what we want to log out is the actual contract. So we can see what that variable holds. Next, go to your terminal and run npm, run start, and then this will start up our DAP and host it here on our port. And now we can see we've got a little bit of an error. And this is because we need to go back to our app and make sure that this is um, asynchronous. Save it. There we go. So now if we connect, we say next, connect, we should be able to see our contract address over there, well, our wallet address. And if we inspect the page here, we will be able to see the actual contract and now we can use it. Cool, so now we can instantiate the contract and now we can actually interact with it. Because we have an instance of the contract, we can now interact with it, reading data and even posting data uh, to our contract. So let's go ahead and create a variable. And here we're going to make this the get tickets um, actual function. So we need a replication kind of, so to speak, what's happening on our contract on the front end. Because here we're going to get the tickets. We're going to query our uh, backend database contract, so to speak. And it's going to return to us a list of tickets. Whenever we interact with a contract, remember it needs to be asynchronous because we need to await for things to finish. Now, the first thing that we can do is maybe define the result. I'm just going to make this a variable. And the result is going to be equal to, well, let's await for the contract. And now that we have the contract, like I said, we can just call functions on it. So the contract also has the get tickets method on it. 
When the result comes back into this, we can now do something with it. First, we're going to console.log the result out, like so. And then we also want to actually set the tickets to the result. And now, let's just maybe call this function as soon as we load the contract. Maybe let's not do that. Let's create a new button in here. All right. So now we are going to just load the data, get the tickets back. If we click on this button, we can now call load data and this will get all of the tickets. But the problem is that we have no data. So we just get back an empty array. So let's go and fix that. I'm also going to take out this console.log for now. So just below the get tickets function, we're going to create a new function. This time we're also going to say this is our create ticket. It's going to be an asynchronous function again. And we basically have the same thing as this. So we're going to have a result and that's going to be equal to awaiting for something to complete. And what we want to wait for is the create a ticket method from the contract, which here we're going to pass in a name. So we can pass in a name as a variable at the top there. And then we can wait for the transaction to actually finish. So we can await for the uh, result. And then we just type in wait, like so. Once this is done, what we want to do is actually get the tickets automatically, almost like a refresh. In order for us to test this out, what we'll need to do is let's go down here and create a new button. And all I'm going to say for our button is add uh, maybe a ticket. And we're going to anyway define a default value. So let's do create ticket. And here I'm going to say test. Now that we have this, we can go back to our app. And let's go ahead and reload this, add a ticket. It's going to ask me to confirm, confirm that. Uh, then we get this back. Let's try and load this. Nothing happened. Now, something to check that you just need to make sure of is by going in here to your settings go into advanced and click on reset account because the nuance might be outdated. I'm going to refresh this, add a ticket, confirm, and there we go. So it automatically got back the list and there we have it. We can add another one and test that out. And now we have two tickets. Perfect. It's working. Now that you know how to basically query data and actually update data with etis.js, the next part is very straightforward. I'm going to go ahead and remove the console.log here and actually paste in two extra functions. This one is exactly the same as this. In fact, we can also just stick to the same thing we're doing here, turning these variables into const and also a transaction over here. It really doesn't matter. It's just a naming convention. But um, the fact stands that this is exactly the same as this, apart from we also passing in the index and we calling update the ticket status. Here, we are renaming the ticket status. But for the variable name, what we are doing is a prompt. So have you ever seen in the browser that the browser asks you to enter your name and pops up a little message box? This is what this is going to do. But essentially, these two are exactly the same as this. So yeah, we've got an update ticket function as well as a rename ticket function. 
Let's see how we can make use of these in our UI. Let's go ahead and build out our UI. Firstly, let's get rid of these divs and let's add a header div. Um, I'm going to add the class names just to describe where we place elements, but we're not going to do the CSS now. We're going to do the CSS in the next part. Here we can have a input uh, section maybe. Yeah, let's have an input section. And lastly, let's have a section and call it main. In here we'll have our three different columns. For the top level one, let's maybe call this our page. Perfect, now we've got a base structure. In the main div, we're going to end up with another div. And here we're going to give it a class name of main column. We're also going to just do a basic style. So maybe we can even do a background color. And here we can do it light, uh, maybe light pink. We're going to have three main columns. So there'll be three. This one will make um, cyan. And then this one, maybe light green, like so. When I save my uh, plugin, the prettier does mess it up a little bit. So uh, maybe we should just turn this into a light blue color. Then at least it will style the same. Uh, but it's important to note that we'll get there just now. But in the main uh, div, we have three other divs. Uh, main col, main column, and then main column as well. Each one is going to be different and serve a different purpose of rendering the tickets, whether it is in the to do column or if it's in the uh, busy column or a done column. Just to define it a bit more inside of uh, these column divs, we can add another div with a class name of main column heading and Inside of it directly, we're going to write, this is the um, to do, to, to. <laughs> this is the to do column. We also will have one there and one there as well. So basically it will end up looking like this without these spaces. We'll have a to do, we'll have busy, and we'll have done. We also technically will have an archive, but we don't need to display that. In the header div, what we want to do here is maybe give it a title. So we're going to add a P tag and write task manager like so. And then we need to maybe display the account. So let's put another P tag and then we can just simply add the account variable. Now, technically, if we go ahead and save this and go back to our app, what we have is the task and then our address. But what happens if we are not connected at all? Let's uh, disconnect this. And when we do that and we refresh and we cancel, there's no way for us to connect, right? So we need to have a button if we are not connected. How do we know if someone is connected or not? Well, it means that the account will be empty, right? So technically what we could do is we could say, well, if the account, as long as the account is uh, not equal to an empty string with a question mark, then we can return uh, whatever this is over here. Otherwise, we need to return a button. So let's just return a normal button like so. And then here we just need to end it, save it. And now this is going to every time pop up. So I just want to say yes. Um, and this is how it basically looks. Now in here we can have a on, uh, on click. And remember we have our init uh, connection uh, function over here, which we can then call. And let's just call this connect. And this is how it's going to be displayed. Now, we can either display the account just like this, or we can also substring it. 
and uh, we can substring it with uh, a nine, nine characters. And when we do that, the full address won't display, which most projects do. They actually take the last part, but I'm gonna just substring it for now. Okay. And then once we have this, we can save, and we can see that here's our address. We are connected, the shortened address. But if we go ahead, go to MetaMask, disconnect ourselves now, refresh, cancel, you can see the connect button is there. And when we click on it, it pops up and we can connect. And then it changes into the address. We also might style the button. So let's go ahead and add a class name, maybe call this big button. And there we go. That's it for our header section. We're going to make some clear separations here from the individual sections so we know um, where they are split. In the input section, we want to have everything to do with the creation of the ticket. So we're going to start off with a nice div as a wrapper. Inside here, we can place a button. We, we will call this create a ticket. And then here, we will need to call the create ticket function. But this time we can't just uh, put it in like this because we need to actually give it a variable. The variable that we're going to give it is the name field. This is this variable here right on the top. And we're going to set the name with an input field. So if we go down, we need an input field here as well. And we're going to have the input, which we'll define in just a second. We're also going to have a button here outside of the wrapper. And we are wrapping these two elements together because later when we style, we're going to use flex to push them apart. For this button down here, we can call it the load data button. And this is simply going to just uh, get the tickets. And then for the input over here, what we'll need to add into the properties is basically this. We're going to give it a class name of input. When we change it, we're going to set the name, which is that variable at the top, to the target, and then give it a placeholder. And that's it. So now we've got our input section defined. We can also go ahead and check it out. And here it is. We can load the data and create a new ticket, maybe test. Let's create one and uh, confirm. And there, we created one, but we can't see it yet. And that's what we are going to be displaying in here. Keep in mind, this is extremely ugly, but we're going to be doing the CSS. Like I said, that's why we're adding the class names. To display the tickets, what we can do underneath each of these headings, we can basically add the tickets, then call map, and then map, I'm going to pass in an item. And just for time being, we're going to uh, return something. So what we're going to return is a P tag. And in here, we're just going to pass the item. Now, I will do more videos on how mappings work, but basically it goes through an array and we can manipulate the data and actually get another array from it. And anyway, we're going to display the data.name. Now we're going to put this over here underneath the busy one, as well as done. Save it and go back to our app. What we see now is test, 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 and it's exactly the same for each one. That's because we are displaying the same data on each field. So here we can say build the UI ticket, create it. But after we create this, it will display on each and every section. And here we can see, there it is. Now, how can we distinguish that uh, the to do column should only show to do, busy should only show busy and done should only be displaying done. Well, that's why we have state on our tickets. What I'm about to do right now might seem confusing, but I'll try my best to explain it. I'm firstly going to change this item name into uh, the actual ticket. And we're going to use that. 
Then I'm also going to add an index. Now you can add the index to um, a mapping, whether you want to use it or not, it's there for you to add. All right. So now that we have this, before we do map the tickets, we will need to actually, um, in, before we map it, we need to filter it. And before we filter it, we need to actually map it before the filtering. It's very confusing, but let me actually explain what we're going to do. We are going to have a dot map. Then we're going to have after the mapping a dot filter. And then we're going to have a dot map again, which is this one, right? So we're going to map filter map. And in the first mapping, what we want to do is actually give us back an object that we can use and filter through. So what I'm going to use here is the T and I for ticket and index. And here I want to return for us a new object. So in this object, I'm going to return an ID, which I'm going to assign as the index. I'm going to then have an item, which will be my T, T representing my ticket. This line will give us back an array. Then we're going to filter that array. The filter that I'm going to apply is going to be applied to the ticket. And it's only going to give us back the ticket where the item, because remember now we've got this item. Uh, so we've got the item dot status, right? And we need to filter wherever the item status is equal to zero. When we do that, we basically use the first mapping to get back an array of objects. Each object will have an ID and an item. Then we filter this array where all the items statuses are equal to zero, meaning that they should live in the to do column. And then we go ahead and map over them just to display it. Most people would ask, why do you need to map it first? Why not just filter it? Well, because we need to map this and get an ID from the start, because as soon as we filter the items, we will not know what ID to use whenever we call a status update, because the array will be mixed up. And that is why we're doing it like this. There are lots of ways of accomplishing this, this is just the straightforward way where I can show you in one or three lines of code. I know this might seem confusing, but you will grasp the concept if you just reiterate over this a few times. The next part is that we return a P tag with a simple name. Now we actually need to return a card so that it can contain buttons for us to perform actions on. So I prepared for us a little card. So I'm going to open some normal brackets and paste it in here. This is the new piece of code. So I'm just going to give it a second so you can see it, write it down, pause the video. But let me explain what it does. And if I do that, it will make more sense. Now, firstly, I see that the key index, this should actually uh, not be in here, it should be here on the top level div. Each uh, element in a list with React needs a key. Anyway, the outer div over here is simply the main ticket. This allows us to style the whole ticket and make it look cool. Then we get this top part over here. This is just the ticket ID. We can now use the ticket with an ID and the reason for that is because we had this object initially. After that, we get the ticket's name and we have another div class, a wrapper. The reason for this wrapper is to combine all of the buttons inside. Each one of these buttons performs either a status update or a rename. For the buttons that updates the state, it takes in the ID, 
and this translate into the index that's used on the contract. Then we pass it the state that we want it to change to. So in order for a ticket to go from state zero to state one, which is busy, we pass in one. If we want it to go to the done column, we'll pass in two. And we don't need the to do button because we are already on state zero. I know this is a lot to take in, but bear with me because we're almost done. So for now, just understand that everything in this ticket array that gets filtered and adds the buttons is in one column. So take all the code from line 124, all these things over here, up until this ticket's keyword. Take everything and replace this mapping in the busy column. In the busy column, once you've pasted it in, we can then change this zero to one. Also, because we are in the busy column, we can change the busy button into uh, to do. Then we need to change this value to zero. We're going to take everything again. So take everything again, go down and paste it in the last column, which is the done column. Now we're going to change this value to two and the done button, we will basically just make it busy this time and make this one. And there you have it. Now, if you save this all and you go back to the application and you load the data, here we can see that our buttons, our tickets, are just sitting into uh, in the to-do column. Nothing is in busy or in done yet. Our application should be working. If we click on the busy button over here and we approve this, we should see that ticket move into the busy column. And there we go. This is also true if we try and move one to the done column. And there we go. We can move one to the uh, to do column again. Or we can even rename something, say hi. And there we go. That is it for this part three in the four part series. In our next video, we are going to have a lot of fun just implementing the CSS, making this app look beautiful because currently it looks ugly. But I had a lot of fun doing this with you. If you did, leave me a comment, like, subscribe, do all that jazz, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers for now.